ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونعود بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل الله وما يضلل فلا هادي الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وان محمدا عبده ورسوله and again all praise and thanks is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek his aid and we seek his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within our own selves and the consequences of our actions whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides he can never be led astray and whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leads astray he will never ever find guidance i bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship that there is no god but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has no partners no associates and i bear witness that muhammad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam is his messenger and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the quran Qala Allah Ta'ala, ayyuhal ladhina amanu wa taqu allaha haqqa tuqatihu. Haqqa tuqatihi, subhanallah, wa la tamutuna ila wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe, fear God, have taqwa, have regard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and do not die except as Muslims. Ameen. Our topic tonight, the strangers. In referencing this topic, I was online and I saw some horror movies named The Strangers. So I thought about that and I thought about the media here in America, how they mix the truth with the falsehood. And um, I thought about the youth, the Muslim youth and the elders, but more importantly, the Muslim youth in dealing with this topic called the strangers and recognizing who the strangers are and recognizing that the strangers are not really strangers. There's something that we strive to be. As Muslims, when we take shahada, you become a stranger because your outlook is different from many of the world view. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said and according to uh, Abu Huraira, and Abu Huraira, Kala, Kala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bada al Islamu gariban, wasa ya'udu kama bada al gariban, fatuba lil gurab. Says that Islam came as a stranger and it will return as a stranger and he said fatuba lil gurab and blessed are the strangers now in dealing with this topic brothers and sisters the stranger refers to a small number a small number of adherents the basic meaning of gharib is strange and it's being far from one's homeland. Many of us are immigrants. Some of us are immigrants by choice. Some of us are immigrants by captivity, if you get my drift. Tuba. So Tuba, glad tidings has been interpreted as meaning paradise or a great tree in paradise. And this shows that supporting Islam is following its commands and may require leaving one's homeland and being patient in bearing the difficulties of being a stranger. As Muslims, we study in the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in the Quran and gives us an evolutionary story and guidance in the Quran. And we talked earlier about, before the presentation, about Ibrahim alayhi salam as being classified as one of the first strangers. Lot, 
many, all of the prophets that preach monotheistic and tawhid, the oneness of God, they are considered strangers. And uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam being the father of rational dis deductive reasoning and logic, he was known for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him in his obedience that his offspring would be prophets. Fast forward, we understand how Ibrahim dealt with the idols in the, in the Kaaba and how they came against him. And we fast forward some 2,000 years along the line of Ibrahim's son Ismail, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we come to Mecca, Mecca, before the advent of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Once Ibrahim had gotten the idols out, guess what? Years later, they reappeared. Business as usual, 360 idols in the Kaaba. And Mecca was thriving with usury, thriving with shirk, polytheism, etc., oppression, you name it. It was a filthy society at that time, troubling our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do something about it. And uh, we know that he had trouble dealing with this society and wanted to find a cure. And us, we are familiar with the, sur the seerah of Muhammad, that the angel Jabril visited him in meditation in the cave and first revealed to him the first Quranic ayat, Ikra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created you. And uh, the rest of the, the chapter you're familiar with. But we also know that he went home to his wife Khadija and had real issues uh, with what he has chosen, he was chosen for. Had real issues. And his wife, we know, consoled him. And then he went back to the cave and didn't receive any, any communication with Jabril for a number of uh, days. And he began to wonder what was going on. Scared all the time. Then the angel Jabril came and the next revelation came. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim ya ayyul ayyuhal muddathir. Oh, you wrapped up. Qum fa'andur. Stand and warn. Giving him the order to go out and start to teach the people and cure the society, if you will, of his ills. Ya ayyuhal muddathir kum fandur wa rabbaka fakabir and glorify your Lord and magnify him. And believe me, that's when the trouble started. And he went to the Kaaba and went to give the good news that he had found, and he found his uncle, Abu Lahab, who tried to stop him from speaking. Some people talked about the message that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said that he leaned against the Kaaba and he would tell the caravanners, the, the, the worshipers and everybody about this new message from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And some would listen and some would not. And some would tell you, don't listen to him because this new language, this new, this new Arabic, if you will, not a new language, this new Arabic, if you listen to him, he will captivate you and turn you against your gods. So in the days that followed, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made numerous attempts to preach to the Meccans. And Abu Lahab, the father of flames, 
which I'm sure he's going to get. And Abu Jahl, his other uncle, they did whatever they could do to sabotage this message. And Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, realized that this was, this was not going to be an easy issue. Not at all. Because of the resistance that he received. And God again warned him and told him that he had confidence in him. And he said, That very prophet, verily, every, after every difficulty comes ease. Comes ease. And so this comforted the prophet and reinforced what was to come. So our prophet was teaching what we call a strange message at that time. A strange message. He brought it to the Arabs. It was unique. No one had ever heard any type of a recitation like that. Even though we had great poets in the Arab society, they didn't have anything that could touch this. As the rappers would say, you can't touch this. Muhammad, prayers and peace be upon him, told the Arabs not to worship the multitudes of inanimate objects, that they can't help you. They're made of wood and stone, and they are creation of your imagination. Now, how could you make a God out of your imagination, and then it can aid you and help you? It doesn't make sense, and it defied logic, and prophet he broke through that and gave them logic to be able to look at their, the error of their ways. But instead, he told them they ought to give the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ati o Allah wa Rasul. O obey Allah and his prophet, the one Lord of the whole universe. So Muhammad also wished to reorganize this society that he had trouble in. He wanted to reorganize it and Muhammad called upon the rich Arabs, the movers, the shakers, as the young people say, the, the ballers. Muhammad called upon the rich Arabs in this great religion to share the wealth, to share the wealth. Share it with the poor, share it with the underprivileged, and uh, give distribution of wealth across the community. And we're still dealing with that today. So many of the rich Arabs, they were money lenders, reba takers, interest, and they were loan sharks. And they had exorbitant rates of interest, charging the people that they would never get out of debt. They were indentured slaves, indentured slaves. So the poor could never repay their debts so they were always indigent to the money loan sharks. They were not sharing any wealth. And by suggesting to them, as Muhammad did, to share the wealth, that was like, uh, as they say, tampering with a hornet's nest. That really got them excited. But the Arabs, all of these new, unfamiliar ideas, in fact, they were revolutionary. And by preaching such ideas, Muhammad had infuriated the status quo or the old heads or the old establishment. He had offended them. And most among him was the uh, Umayyad clan of the Quraysh. And they were members, and they were leaders of this particular society. Even though Muhammad, he was known as El Amin. He was known as El Amin, so they trusted him. And he would tell them. If there's an army behind that mountain getting ready to attack you, would you believe me? And they says, yes, Elamin, we believe you. So he had credibility, excellent credibility. And um, so they would start to believe what he, what he was preaching. And so Muhammad and the message of Islam, they saw a threat to their social system, which was based upon privilege and strong armed force. Therefore, they resolved to maintain 
the status quo. Let's keep it the way it is, Muhammad. But in the years to come, they were to form an army against him. And in the Quran, it says that um, they came out with opposition to Muhammad. And uh, they plotted against him. And we know the history. And in the Quran, it says, Why is it Yamkuru bika alladina kafaru li yusbituk au yakatuluk au yukrijuk? Why Yamkuruna, wa Yamkuru Allah, wa Allahu Kairul Makirin? And Allah speaking to Muhammad when they were getting ready to attack him and plot and planned on him. And he says, Oh, remember, Muhammad, then. When those who disbelieved plotted against you to restrain you or kill you or evict you from Mecca, but they plan, but Allah plans. And Allah is the best of planners. But there were a few individuals who found out strong appeal in new ideas of, of Muhammad, and it appealed to them. It was irresistible to them because they were the downtrodden, they were the poor, they were the have-nots of the society. And what Muhammad taught boosted their self-esteem, put them on equal par, pretty much how you have it in 2017, that the haves and the have-nots. This was a religion that balanced things out. And so this was a threat. If they made the slave equal to them, that was unthinkable. To make the slave equal to them, to give to clothe the slave in the same money that same clothes that we have, that's unthinkable. To have for the Arabs, they were would not denounce idolatry, excuse me, but this was for economic reasons only because they were the benefactors of large sums of money by pushing this idea. And Muhammad, he peeped their game. Allah had showed him how to destroy this, this uh, status quo. But the one that the self-selected elite of the Quraysh, they found most outrageous was the notion fostered by Muhammad that the members of the depressed the despised, the exploited classes, they were the ones that were going to be equal. And they couldn't take that. They couldn't take that at all. And so as things went on, it really got bad. Racial pride is discounted in Islam. Is that not right? According to the Quran, all men have descended from Adam. And Adam was a handful of dust. And Iblis, the shaitan, became the accursed one precisely because he argued for the superiority of race, of what he presumed to be his high origins, as against what he considered to be the lowly origins of us, of man. This was the first racist. And so this was where the racist idea started. And Allah addresses it in the Quran. He says, Kala ana khairu minhu kalaktani minnar. Say, I am better than him because I have been created from fire. Wa kalaknahu mintin. And he is created from turab, from dirt, from dust. This was the first racist. This was the first racist ideology pushed in the, in the creation. So in the sight of the Quran, the most exalted person, brothers and sisters, is the mutaki, the one who has taqwa, as we said in the opening ayat, the one who has the most regard for his Lord, taqwa. It was then stated that they resolved not only to oppose Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also to destroy the hearsay 
called Islam altogether. Let's eradicate it. Before it could strike its roots and before it could become viable, before it became stabilized in the community. So they had to come up with a plan. I hope I don't go too long here. Mecca was in a state of war. The Quraysh opened a campaign against Islam by harassing and persecuting the Muslims. Those Muslims who were slaves, who saw this, this big benefit in accepting Islam of equality, of race, equality of wealth, of quality in the social strata, they came against them. They started to persecute them, as they do now. It's a never word. Now, let us fast forward. The strangers, some victims of persecution. Many were uprooted and killed by the Meccans. Now, we're talking about the strangers, that those who accepted Islam, they were considered strangers, the Gurab. Similar to what we are in this society here. Bilal, the Ethiopian, a classic textbook example of someone being persecuted. And we know the story of Bilal, and he was a slave of Umayyah bin Khalif. And we know that he was drugged. They dragged him in the sand, tied him, put rocks on his chest to make him recant that there is no God but Allah. No, no God but Allah. And he took all of that torture, and he never gave up his faith, even though he may could have, but he held out until one day Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala an, came and saw him and purchased his freedom. The first martyr, or the first shahida, or the first martyr to Islam was a woman and a slave, a former slave, Sumaya, a Hashabi. And she was killed by Abu Lahab, the prophet's uncle. They were beat. And they were beat. And one of the main torturers was Umar ibn Qatab. One of the main torturers. They said that Umar beat women, slaves who accepted Islam. There was one sister that he beat. He said he beat her. Then he stopped and looked at her, and he said, I'm not beating you out of pity. I'm beating you. I'm, I stopped beating you because I'm tired. And that was a classic example because we know that Umar, radiallahu an, became from the worst to the first. And he was able to establish himself as the second caliph. And that's a good sign for us. But there's a parallel that I want us to see in closing. And as believers, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there were 10 that he had promised paradise. There were 10 believers that he had promised paradise. And many died for the sake of Islam. And they said that the martyr is in Jannah before a drop of their blood hits the ground. So those were 10. Out of that 10, I don't even think Bilal was named or the sister, the first martyr. But of a surety, they're in the Jannah. And Bilal strikes a parallel, especially with African Americans in, in, in America. 
because of the great position that the Prophet ﷺ put him. Okay? And he stands as a symbol not only for African Americans, but he stands as a symbol of oppression for everybody. And we should always reflect. And I tell people at the masjid, I say, we're still trying to get the rock off of our chest. As far as social equality. We've gotten a taste of Trumpism. We've got a taste of how racially motivated things can be in this country. We've got a, a taste of all of that. And as Gurab, as strangers, that's us. Because we say, La ilaha illallah. So young people, we have to understand that we're strangers. And when we're treated indifferent, we always stand up, but we have to understand our situation, that they're going to come against us because we're strangers. Now, I hope I was coming clear as what the Muslim Ummah is about, as far as who we are, and to understand who we are, our identity. And I use the African American because he has went through hundreds of years of oppression here in this country, okay? Where everything that he knew, all of his history, all of his background, everything was emptied out and he was stomped into the dirt just like clay. But one thing they didn't know, that Allah is Akbar. And he didn't know that we were seeds when he stepped us in the clay. And now we are in new soil here in America. And Allah has realigned us with our identity as Muslims. Alhamdulillah. So he has realigned as Muslims and restored our deen because we didn't have one. They, they emptied us out like a, like a, a, a bucket. And that's a miracle, if you, if you would agree with me, that a people that have been pushed into the dirt. And this was the same way in Mecca. The same way in Mecca that we had people pushed into the dirt. And Islam raised them up to equality. That la ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. So I praise Allah and I thank you for having me. And I thought I would at least have an hour with you. Alhamdulillah. So I leave you as I came from all the prophets from Adam to Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum.